is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. As a homeless camp on the downtown east side gets bigger, Vancouver's mayor says it's time for the prime minister to step in. More than 100 tents are now set up in Oppenheimer Park. The city is hoping federal dollars can go toward building social housing. But as our John Hernandez reports tonight, there is no word on when or even if the money will come in. Carl Porton and Marco Tinaku are happy right where they are. I find it uh, it's very relaxing. They met inside Oppenheimer Park. They've lived here for months, carving out their own small corner inside the growing camp. To live here is an amazing experience to find out just how much for the resources around and, and, and the amount of caring, compassionate families that do not live here too, that give up their spare time, their free time to come down from peanut butter sandwiches to full-blown uh, barbecues. But even they will admit things can get a bit dangerous after dark. Just the bewitching hour, right? After supper there when the night comes, it, it gets a little. Your name to this fine gentleman here. A man was shot near the park last week. Advocates think the incident could trigger a mass eviction before there's enough housing available. They won't be safe if they're dispersed. They, they need to be together so that other people can look after their tents, so there can be, be help if there is an overdose. City Councillor Gene Swanson wouldn't confirm if there's any backdoor talks of clearing out the park, but Mayor Kennedy Stewart says getting people out is a priority. The only problem? The money isn't there. We have had lots of federal promises for housing, but now the rubber has to hit the road. The federal government says it's pledged about $83 million to fight homelessness in Vancouver over the next four years. But Stewart says the city is still waiting for it. Pressure to do something is starting to mount. People's lives are in danger. Uh, we have significant cr criminal activity happening there. This is not, uh, should not be condoned and we should not be putting up with this and the city needs to take a tougher stance on this. Residents here, many from SROs that have since been condemned, think it's only a matter of time before they're forced out. Obviously a concern because the next concern would be for us to go where. As for where they'll end up, it could be shelters, SROs or modular housing. Options that might be comforting to some, but not all. It's no good. Yeah. It's the park is good, man. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Another city councillor has abandoned Mayor Doug McCallum's Safe Surrey Coalition. Jack Hundile announced he was leaving the group this morning. He's the third member of the coalition to jump ship. Municipal Affairs reporter Justin McElroy is watching this story for us tonight. So, Justin, what reasons did Hundile give for his decision? Well, Mike, people might remember that Hundile was a 25-year veteran of the RCMP before he was elected to council last October. And during the campaign, Doug McCallum said that he was going to work with Hundile as the city transitioned to an independent police force from the RCMP. But Hundile says that the mayor hasn't been listening to him, hasn't really had a conversation with him for months, and the lack of transparency and communication were the breaking points for him deciding to be one of the increasing number of people to leave the Safe Surrey Coalition. So I think it's, uh, it's been very difficult to sort of get um, him to, to, to hear other elected councillors. Uh, and certainly it's not just my experience in that, uh, his experience with uh, you know, other councillors that left Safe Surrey Coalition. Look, I mean, we're, not, we're just wrapping up our first term in office and you started with uh, you know, seven councillors in one coalition and now you're down to four. Now, those that have left the Surrey Coalition say they're not going to create their own splinter party, but they will work together from time to time. But certainly it adds to the increasing instability and intrigue of what's happening at City Council there. Yeah, so where does that leave things, this latest shift in terms of politics there? Well, you heard from Councillor Hundile there, and here's where things stand right now. Of the eight members of the Safe Surrey Coalition that were elected in October, five of them are still in the party, the Mayor McCallum and four councillors. Uh, three in the last two months, Brenda Locke, Stephen Pettigrew, and now Jack Hundile leaving. But ultimately, because there's eight people on council, you do the math with the one person that wasn't elected as part of the coalition, still five to four, 
for the mayor. He can still enact his agenda to the point, but a lot of the big stuff that he wants to do requires outside levels of government. For moving to an independent police force, that still requires the provincial government to sign off. They haven't yet. And his other big promise, an extension of the SkyTrain line to Langley, we're probably going to hear from TransLink tomorrow over whether McCallum's promise that it could be done in one stage without any additional funding from higher levels of government can be completed. If TransLink says yes, makes it a good week for McCallum at the end. If they say no, then it puts a further damper on what's been a troubling few days for him. Well, we'll watch to see what happens tomorrow. Thanks, Justin. Justin McElroy, Municipal Affairs reporter. The death of a man at a Richmond trampoline park and a number of other serious injuries has led to a call for regulations. Right now, no trampoline parks in the province or the country are regulated. The industry welcomes the news, but will regulations alone keep people safe? Tina Lovgren reports. Trampoline parks have jumped in popularity over the past decade. My daughter loves it. She's here with her friends. It's, it's jumping, bouncing, flips. It's just a great time. But a number of injuries have led to calls to regulate the industry. In April, a four-year-old suffered a skull fracture at Langley's Extreme Air Park. And in 2018, Jay Greenwood from Victoria died at the park's Richmond location. And ever since, the industry has come under scrutiny. A hidden camera investigation by CBC's Marketplace uncovered unsafe behavior and lack of supervision. Obviously, we're concerned about uh, the increasing uh, injuries that is occurring, and that's why we are taking action. Trampoline parks aren't regulated anywhere in Canada, but Technical Safety BC says they need to be and plans to take on the role itself here in BC. The independent organization oversees the safety of other amusements like roller coasters, zip lines and even bouncy castles. But the safety watchdog doesn't yet know exactly what the regulations will look like. At this point, we're still working on the model. We will be making the final full recommendation to the government at the end of the year. Some trampoline parks say they welcome regulations, but say they only go so far. BC Technical Safety's role is one small piece of a very large puzzle, and it's really up to owner-operators to make sure their parks are, are having an inclusive or a wholesome risk management approach. Uh, that includes everything from signage and training to the technical aspects that technical safety is covering. While regulations may help keep parks accountable to safety standards, trampoline goers say the rest is up to the user. I, I feel like you set the tempo and the pace on like your safetyness. The Technical Safety Board will submit its recommendations to the province by the end of the year. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Richmond. A new report from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives has tracked rental affordability in cities across Canada. For minimum wage earners, it's next to impossible to rent in most cities. And in Vancouver, it's even harder. In Vancouver, a full-time worker would need to make more than $35 an hour to afford an average two-bedroom apartment. That means a minimum wage earner would have to work 84 hours a week to afford the average one-bedroom apartment or 112 hours a week for a two-bedroom. Vancouver is the costliest city to rent in, with Toronto coming in a close second. Only three cities in Canada meet the affordability criteria for minimum wage cities, Saguenay, Trois-Rivières, and Sherbrooke. I think this is related to the ongoing polarization and, and inequality that we are seeing in our society, that uh, folks at the very top of the income ladder are getting most of the gains. People in the middle are kind of struggling to stay where they are, and, and we see sort of net loss in terms of uh, folks who are on the, the bottom. CCPA looked at Statistics Canada data on wages from previous years and rental information from the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. While well, several gardens in North Vancouver, all tended by volunteers, are helping food bank users shop for fresh and affordable vegetables. As the CBC's Mickey Cowan reports tonight, it's a labor of love for some local gardeners. It's fresh and it's picked with TLC. Jeanette Bertelson is a widow on fixed income. She relies on the food bank, so buying fresh and healthy produce can be a challenge. It's hard. You work and uh, live from payday to payday. But she can always afford the radishes and other greens from the sharing garden. Nice and hot because I get the white ones with the white chip. The stand runs at the North Shore neighborhood house every Wednesday, selling fresh veggies at a fraction of the price to food bank users. 
It's run by a farming initiative called the Edible Garden Project. We price everything as affordable as we can, so everything is either 25 cents, 50 cents. Being able to have access to fresh produce um, and also the dignity to just be able to buy some yourself and not necessarily walk around and just take everything for free. The veggies may end up here, but they sprout here along with four other gardens on the North Shore, in backyards and churchyards alike. There's lots of greens, uh, we do root vegetables, carrots, radishes, turnips, lots of herbs, beans, peas. Every week up to 70 volunteers come here to the sharing garden. They spend hundreds of their own hours tending the garden and harvesting its produce, all for people who need it. They love that the produce that they're growing is actually going to people that otherwise maybe wouldn't have access to fresh produce. She says winter can be a challenge. The program runs off grants, and many of those run out by the winter. But the demand for fresh veggies doesn't. Our sharing gardeners are doing an awesome job growing tons of produce, but the amount of people that use the food bank, we could definitely use more. McGilvery says she would love to see the program expand to other food banks. But for now, just those on the North Shore take home the fresh bounty every week. The edible project here, the garden, is the best. That's my favorite place. <laughs> Mickey Cowan, CBC News, North Vancouver. A special ceremony was held in New Westminster today to commemorate the wrongful execution of a Chilcotin chief more than 150 years ago. Basically a funeral for Chief Ahan, being able to pay our respects, to see the songs, to smudge, to say our prayers, say our farewell, to come to the burial site. Chief Ahan was Which one of was six war chiefs awesome. executed during what became known as the Chilcotin War. He had gone to New Westminster to offer reparations, but instead was tried and hanged. Last year, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau exonerated the chiefs, including Ahan, and apologized for their executions. Today's ceremony included prayers at the old courthouse where Ahan was executed and a gathering at New Westminster Secondary School where he is believed to be buried. A former WestJet flight attendant is moving forward with her proposed class action lawsuit against WestJet after alleged sexual assault. Today, the Supreme Court of Canada refused to hear WestJet's bid to end a sexual harassment class action suit. Former WestJet flight attendant Mandalena Lewis alleges she was sexually assaulted by a pilot back in 2010. She was fired from her eight-year job and alleges the pilot was protected. Her class action suit will represent current and former WestJet flight attendants. WestJet has denied allegations that they failed to take action after she reported the incident. Well, the Prime Minister was in Victoria this afternoon to announce more efficient and affordable public transportation in the region. Justin Trudeau, Premier John Horgan and TransLink announcing more than $79 million in joint funding to buy more than 100 public buses in Victoria. The new buses are intended to replace older ones and support communities where ridership is increasing. More and more students, workers and families are choosing to hop on a bus to get from point A to point B. Not only is that great for traffic efficiency and safety, it's also great for the environment. The funding will also go towards 10 long-range electric buses in the area. Two of Vancouver's beaches remain closed for swimming due to high E. coli levels, and two more have been labeled swim at your own risk. Trout Lake is the latest addition to the list. Advisories are issued if the levels exceed 200 E. coli bacteria per 100 milliliters of water. Meanwhile, Sunset Beach has been closed for the same reason since late June. English Bay and Second Beach are both open for swimming, but their last samples were over the limit, resampling is underway. Brett's here now with the forecast. Uh, you were talking a while ago about a possible thunderstorm rolling through the area. Has that materialized? It is just about here. I don't want to ruin the surprise just yet, but maybe, hey, that's what I'm here for. I want to give you as much heads up as you possibly can. I was just looking at our radar, which I'll show you in a second, and right now there appear to be some storms over Vancouver Island, but right now our temperatures, they're already cooling down a little bit. And just as a little bit of a, a tell here, when the temperatures start to drop, that's usually a sign that some active weather is going to be coming in. So I wanted to show you 
you on the radar right now. What we're looking at, you can see over the Strait of Georgia, we're just starting to get a few spotty showers, but essentially Nanaimo toward Campbell River throughout much of the afternoon, they've been experiencing some fairly heavy downpours. And with the westerly winds that we're expecting over the next little while, I would honestly expect this to be making its way, especially onto the west coast there, anywhere, say, the airport, Richmond, Delta, and then, of course, even here in downtown Vancouver. Now, that said, this wasn't the only area that has been seeing some active weather. We've been seeing this fairly <coughs> widespread, in fact, all across the prairies. Right now, the only severe thunderstorm watches that we have in effect for the province of BC are into the Peace region. They are just watchers at this point in time, so that doesn't really concern me too, too much because they have been there for all day, but it is worth mentioning in case you are in the region. And to leave off on something that might take you by surprise, we know there's a little bit of heat going on into eastern Canada, and I say that almost as a bit tongue-in-cheek, but did you know that also the Northwest Territories is under a heat warning right now. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Brett. We'll talk <laughs> to you again in a bit. And just a reminder, you can watch and share all of our stories by visiting us online. Follow CBC Vancouver on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. And stream our content live and on demand with our free mobile app, CBC Gem. You can also go more in-depth on our stories by going to our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Disturbing chants at a Trump rally last night, the crowd taunting a Somali-born House representative, how Trump reacted last night and then today, coming up after the break. Well, it's Throwback Thursday, and tonight we're taking you back to the 1980s, when a duel was shaping up between a BC business and one in Saskatchewan. Their weapon of choice? Chopsticks. CBC's Dan Bjarnason got a look at how small sticks became big business in Canada's West. How could something so genteel, so delicate, end up in something so akin to a war? And how could this war, about wood basically, get started on the Ball Prairie where forests aren't exactly the first thing that pops to mind? The drama starts with someone who's uh, king of the castle. Uh, some of people uh, called me the uh, father of chopsticks. And so he is, so far. Wang Park, a Korean-born businessman. On this flat, windswept city, he set up the biggest chopstick plant on the continent. He trucks the wood in from northern Saskatchewan. The Canadian aspen, particularly Saskatchewan aspen, is uh, the best quality in the world. Down here in Regina, his wood is steamed, debarked, processed, and finally, chop, 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 by the gazillion, it seems, into chopsticks. Actually, 400,000 pairs each day. Off they're shipped, mostly to New York City, San Francisco, and Korea. It seems like a gold mine, but not quite. So now there's competition, competition from an upstart out here in British Columbia, where they're actually quite big on things like forests, trees, lumber, and wood. All this will come as news to Mr. Park back there in Saskatchewan, but it's competition with a vengeance. There's a chopstick duel developing in this culinary struggle. The upstart is also a businessman from Korea, as it turns out, a Mr. J. An. They're just starting up here, they hope to churn the stuff out by the cargo boat full. Three, maybe four million pairs each day. And that's just the Korean market alone. Tomorrow, maybe the world. There are no comparable plants in North America of that size as yet, uh, in production as yet. Um, in Asia, I don't know. I would have to ask him. This, he says it, it is the largest plant in the world right now. Back in Regina, Mr. Park calculates he may set up operations closer to some actual trees. Meantime, he's working on new prototypes, escalating into coffee stirrers, tongue depressors, and popsicle sticks. The research continues. And back on the West Coast, they're beavering away, closing the chopstick gap. A report from a uh, great storyteller on a great story, Dan Bjornesson. Okay, stay with us. Uh, we're going to have the latest of the political strife from south of the border coming up next.
chants of send her back aimed at a Democratic representative at a Donald Trump campaign rally in North Carolina. This just days after attacks by the U.S. president on four Democrats, all women of color, telling them to go back where they came from. As the CBC's Katie Simpson reports, Trump is trying to distance himself from the latest chanting controversy. It was quite a chant. The president is trying to put some distance between himself and his base, denouncing supporters who chanted, send her back at his political rally last night. I was not happy with it. Uh, I disagree with it. The chant was aimed at former Somali refugee turned U.S. citizen and Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, one of four Democrats Donald Trump has been attacking since Sunday. Why didn't you stop them? Why didn't you ask them to stop saying that? Well, number one, I, I think I did. I started speaking very quickly. It, it really was a loud... I disagree with it, by the way. Trump's claim that he tried to stop the chant is not true. He gave it room to breathe, an airing that lasted 13 seconds. Omar has a history of launching vicious anti-Semitic screeds. The exchange made some Republicans cringe. Congressman Adam Kinzinger tweeted, the scene would send chills down the spines of our founding fathers. I don't like it. Senior Republicans may not have liked the rally, but some are willing to defend the president and his attacks that triggered the rant, arguing it's about politics, not race. I don't think a Somali refugee embracing Trump would not have been asked to go back. Omar says Republicans are trying to stifle dissent and scoffed at repeated questions on whether this is racism. The fact that you're still asking that question is really what's wrong. Because, because we have said this president is racist. We have condemned his racist remarks. I believe he is fascist. While she remains a target for Trump in Washington. Omar returned home to Minnesota to a completely different kind of chant. Republicans are now worried about two conflicting possibilities. One, the president changes his mind and embraces the center back chant. Or two, he doesn't, but it sticks anyway and becomes a recurring theme at those rallies Trump loves to hold. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. For his part, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau denounced the chanting made by Trump supporters last night. As Sarah Levitt reports, Trudeau was asked about it at the end of the Canada-European Union trade meeting in Montreal. Hurtful, wrong, and completely unacceptable. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was unequivocal in his reaction to the chants at a rally for Donald Trump. I want everyone in Canada to know that those comments are completely unacceptable and um, should not be allowed or encouraged uh, in Canada. Standing side by side with the president of the European Council, the comments come after a summit that saw Donald Tusk praising Canada. In the unstable global setting we live in, it is reassuring that the friendship between the EU and Canada is as stable as ever. I really feel at home here for many reasons. Also because in Montreal, I didn't hear anyone shouting, send him back. A not so thinly veiled jab at Trump and his supporters. Yet while Tusk attempted to be more cautious with his words when pressed, he couldn't help himself. Sometimes if, if, if you feel that uh, something is totally unacceptable, you have to react. Despite business, despite interest, for me, values are much more important. Than trade. Trump was never referred to by name, but the two leaders, both of whom project the image of progressive values, were clear in their condemnation, even if it means risking backlash from an important ally. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Quebec's highest court has upheld the province's law banning religious symbols for some public servants. The judge in the case refused to grant an injunction suspending it. The court rejected the argument that the bill causes irreparable harm to the people affected. It said affidavits submitted in support of that argument were hypothetical and speculative in nature and added it was highly unusual for a court to issue an injunction 
against a law that was already passed in the legislature. The court motion was launched by the National Council of Canadian Muslims and the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Well, they are the apex predator of our oceans, but a pod of orcas near BC is struggling to survive. Their struggle is the focus of our newest podcast. We'll preview that for you next. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. You know, we, we have had lots of federal promises for housing, but now the rubber has to hit the road. Vancouver's mayor says it's time for Ottawa to step in as a growing homeless camp in the city's downtown east side ignites safety concerns and calls for social housing. We're concerned about uh, the increasing uh, injuries that is occurring, and that's why we are taking action. 
The death of a man at a Richmond trampoline park and several other serious injuries has led to a call for the regulation of all trampoline parks in the province. Our sharing gardeners are doing an awesome job growing tons of produce, but the amount of people that use the food bank, we could definitely use more fresh produce. Feeding the hungry, a North Shore sharing garden is helping out the food bank. Well, our fascination with killer whales runs as deep as the waters they rule. They are the ocean's apex predator, and yet one of their pods is dying out. The reason why and our connection to them is the focus of CBC's latest podcast. The first episode is out now. And to give you a taste of what you can expect, Anita spoke to its producer, Catherine Rolfson. Have a listen. Catherine, we've had so much coverage on orcas over the past year. How does this podcast go deeper? I know, doesn't it seem like every other day there's another orca story in the news? Whether we're watching the transient killer whales here in Burrard Inlet or hearing updates about the latest baby in J-Pod, this new female calf that has everybody so excited. But now there's also J-17, an important matriarch, the grandmother whale who's missing. Researchers fear she may be dead. And on top of all of that, there's the latest legal fight about the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Southern residents are being used as a poster child to stop vessel traffic in that case. So what our podcast does is it tries to bring all these threads together. It takes J-Pod, the family and its dramatic struggles as the main character. And then we look at all the various threats that we keep hearing about, the decline in Chinook salmon, increased vessel traffic and toxins in our waters. And we try to figure out how all these things interplay to threaten this family. That being said, some may question whether it's worth all of the money to actually save this particular pod, given there are so many other orcas in our waters. Why is this so important? And that's a very real question because losing the southern residents does not mean losing orcas. We talked about the transients, the northern resident population is doing well. So as we were researching for this podcast, we kept asking guests that, why save the southern residents when other orcas are doing fine? And I think one of the most powerful quotes that I heard was from researcher Deborah Giles. Why don't you take a listen? I liken it to something like um, a, a small uh, indigenous population of people in the middle of a forest that, uh, that have evolved in that region. They know how to live perfectly in their habitat. Um, they have a right to be here um, and we have a responsibility not to do things that will harm them from being able to carry out their, their life trajectory. And Anita, as Gloria and I were researching and interviewing for this podcast, I was really struck by how invested so many people are in saving this particular pod of orcas, this family. Not just activists, not just scientists, but government and industry as well. The trouble is not everybody agrees on how to do it. And it's an open question whether any of these efforts are going to come in time to save this family from extinction. Looking forward to listening to it, Catherine Rolfson. Thank you. You're welcome. At 6.32, a live look over at Lower Lonsdale tonight. Looks like we're in for a nice stretch of summer weather. Brett's also tracking a possible thunderstorm in the region. His full forecast is coming next. They're the most studied and famous whale family in the world. What's pushing J-Pod to the brink? I'm Gloria Makarenko, host of the new CBC British Columbia original podcast, Killers. Is it too late to save them?
Brad is back. You're tracking this possible thunderstorm in the region? Yeah, it looks like it might be losing a little bit of energy, but yeah. nevertheless, I wouldn't be surprised to still see a quick and heavy downpour coming right across sort of like the western edge here. So it's going to be, I would say, maybe in about the next hour. Uh, it could get a little bit dry. I know, set your clocks just in case you have any plans, <laughs> but I am thinking that might be the case. So I'll get to that in one quick second, right. but I did want to show you actually a beautiful view of the sea to sky. This is a time lapse. Oh, wow. It's this type of imagery that really makes me feel super lucky to be out here in this province to have such an amazing view those mountains the roadways the water it is just absolutely stunning I don't think there's another way to describe it but that and it's funny because the sea to sky is actually one of those regions as well that could be getting into a little bit of that rain and I did I just wanted to mention one more time this area again it's gonna look really ominous over here you can see kind of on the Sunshine Coast over towards Seashell Nanaimo all of this green here is rain that could be heavy at times and there were lightning strikes earlier on in the day so if this continues on its trajectory over the next hour or so that should be making it right along here so just be atten uh, pay attention to that rather I think the rest of the region actually should be quite fine so we had all of that rain yesterday as you know right so that actually did wonders for our fire danger rating I love to talk about this because for the next few days when we don't have any rain in the forecast this is just gonna be steadily rising and for the first time and I'm not really sure how long we aren't seeing any extremes on here normally it was the Northwest and the Northeast that were into those categories but even they got a bit of rain and helped to deal with that so over the next couple of days what can we be expecting? Well, it is going to be a beautiful weekend. All of this moisture is really going to be starting to dry up throughout the day on Friday. And as for Saturday, unless really you're towards, say, Port Hardy in the far north of Vancouver Island or up toward Bella Bella, the rest of the province is actually looking very beautiful. So those temperatures, of course, are going to be on the up and up. As we get through the overnight period, really there's just a risk for a stray shower tomorrow morning, say, into the Fraser Valley. But by the afternoon and evening, we are going to be in the clear, say goodbye to the rain, find those sunglasses, and definitely Definitely put on your sunscreen because by the time that we get into our long range here you are gonna probably like what you see Friday again 21 degrees with a mix of Sun and clouds but Saturday and Sunday look at that temperatures into the mid 20s lots of sunshine expected on both of those days and as we get ahead even into next week we're gonna be hanging on to that warmth maybe a few clouds here and there but I'm feeling pretty confident about not uh, seeing any more rain for the next little while good confidence level high yeah I would give it that awesome, <laughs> awesome looking stretch Some I try my best Summer is finally here. See, because exactly. It, right? yeah, I would agree. Okay. I know. <laughs> Very good. Okay, uh, it's a big problem here in Vancouver and anywhere, really, where a city borders a big body of water. Absolutely. Floating trash. Yeah, so in Toronto, uh, the port is using new technology to help clean out the city's outer harbour. Three floating garbage cans have been installed, actually, and they're capable, believe it or not, of collecting up to four kilograms of trash a day. Yeah, the CBC's Natalie Nanowski shows us how they work. Take a look at any body of water and there's often trash, especially plastic, floating on the surface. Until recently, the only way to get these gross floaters out of the water was with a net. And it's not exactly that easy. But now a new innovation takes all the manual labor out of it. That's the sea bin cleans up our garbage. Uh, it basically just sits there in the water uh, with a pump that pumps about 2,500 litres per minute, pushing downwards and the pump sort of just slowly pulls garbage towards it and traps it. Let's take out the bin and see what's in there. Alrighty. All right. Little bits of garbage that you would normally find in the water floating. That's pretty huge and impressive. <laughs> <laughs> but smaller stuff like bottle caps and things right. like that. Right, those are harder to catch. And then if you look closely, you actually might see some of the smaller plastics that are in there. Oh wow, that's a yeah. tiny piece of plastic. The Seabin can trap pieces as small as two millimeters. It was invented by two Australian surfers who got fed up seeing garbage every time they went into the ocean. They made a prototype and found a manufacturer in Europe. So they, they gave us the idea and we basically worked on it to make it fit uh, for the marinas. So we really improved it uh, to make it collect as much trash as possible and uh, to make it last uh, as long as possible once it's uh, installed. It's made entirely out of recycled material. There's even a sponge inside that sucks up oil and gas. In total, the Seabin can pick up nearly four kilograms of trash a day. So, so far in, in one year and three months, uh, we have sold about 720 Seabins in the world. 
and uh, about 110 tons of trash have been collected. The Outer Harbour Marina is part of a pilot project. It's one of the first marinas in Canada to get the bins. If all goes well, they could start popping up in marinas all over the city. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. An arson attack in Kyoto, Japan is now the nation's worst mass murder in nearly two decades. After the break, we'll take you to the tragic scene. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Your favorite summer tradition is back. Musical Nooners is back for its 10th year, so grab a lunch and a friend and enjoy free concerts weekdays at noon all summer long. And join us at the Surrey Fusion Festival on July 20th to 21st at Holland Park. Swing by our tent for fun and prizes and meet CBC Vancouver's Anita Bath and Michelle Elliott. For more on these events, check us out online. Many people in Kyoto, Japan, are still trying to come to terms with Thursday's horrific arson attack. 33 people were killed in the fire, another 36 injured. One man was arrested almost immediately, but as the CBC's Tanya Fletcher reports, details about him and his motive remain unclear. Sirens blare as smoke billows from this yellow three-story building, home to the renowned Kyoto Animation Studio, nestled in a residential area of Japan's ancient city. Witnesses say mid-morning a man burst in, doused the office with fuel and screamed die as he set the building ablaze. The fire spread so quickly dozens died in their offices despite firefighters' efforts to save them. With the main exit blocked by flames, many employees were sent scrambling up the staircase trying to reach the roof. Many of the victims' bodies found just steps from that exit. Those who survived are triaged under this orange tent. The bodies of those who didn't carried away under tarps. 
The suspect is a 41-year-old man. His arrest captured on this cell phone video. He's now recovering in the hospital from serious burns. This witness says he seemed to be in pain, but also angry as if he was resentful. She adds, I heard him say something like, you copied my work. Police say the suspect was never an employee of the animation company, but the head of the studio says they recently received death threats by email. It's unclear, though, if they were sent by the suspect. The attack was Japan's worst mass killing since 2001. That was also arson. 44 people were found dead at a gambling club in Tokyo. After this latest tragedy, fans and people in the animation industry have been expressing shock and grief on social media as did Japan's Prime Minister, who called this arson attack too appalling for words. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. A New York judge has denied high-profile financier Jeffrey Epstein bail as he awaits trial on sex trafficking and conspiracy charges. The lawyer for his alleged victims spoke shortly after the decision came down. We're thrilled today with a ruling by Judge Berman, and we thank Alex Ross Miller and his entire team for the hard work that they put in to get to this place. Only by taking away the freedom of Jeffrey Epstein can we restore the freedom of these victims. They have been living in fear and intimidation since the day they were abused by him, and now he is in jail. A U.S. federal court judge ordered Epstein remain in jail until the trial. He's facing a number of charges, including sex trafficking involving underage girls. He had agreed to post a $100 million bond, pay for security at his home, and be under electronic monitoring. But prosecutors say he is an extreme flight risk, pointing to piles of cash and diamonds and a fake passport found in his New York mansion. The federal government took a costly step today to address the issue of sexual assault in the military, telling a judge it's ready to pay close to a billion dollars to settle class action lawsuits. The settlement needs to be approved by the courts, but as Salima Shivji reports, former members of the armed forces are claiming victory after a battle that's dragged on for years. After years of suppressing the trauma, Larry Beatty has banjo to help him move forward. The former sailor says he was sexually assaulted by a superior officer 40 years ago when he was just 18. I kept my mouth shut and um, the whole ordeal came out in about 2009, I would go to see my psychologist or psychiatrist, and sometimes it would take me three hours to come back home because I couldn't drive. I was shaking, I was crying on the side of the road. But today there's some relief, a small sense of victory <laughs> for Beatty and for other victims too. Like Amy Graham, who spent six years in the military, years, she says, full of taunts and harassment, even assault. Feeling really good because this has taken two and a half years to get to this point. So it was difficult to share my story, but I thought it was worth the sacrifice. That sacrifice was recognized by the federal court judge who praised both sides for working together. It wasn't always the case. Last year, government lawyers argued the armed forces did not owe it to soldiers to protect them from harassment and abuse. But that aggressive line bothered the prime minister. I've asked the attorney general to follow up uh, with the lawyers to make sure that uh, we argue things that are consistent with this government's philosophy. Today, the prime minister said the deal took some negotiation but was important to his government. We have uh, moved forward on uh, changing approaches, on responding to past wrongs, and uh, working with uh, survivors of sexual uh, uh, assault and abuse to try and uh, make sure that we end this process, that we change our mindset. A change of mindset is also part of the settlement. The military is promising to keep working to tackle sexual misconduct, though Amy Graham, for one, reserves judgment. Our settlement includes policy change, um, but we still have a long road ahead. To make sure there are fewer victims in the ranks. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Back here at home, a man charged in connection with the death of a toddler who was poisoned by snake venom more than five years ago has pleaded guilty. The Crown says Henry Thomas pleaded guilty to failing to provide the necessities of life. Earlier this year, North Vancouver RCMP said Thomas was taking care of two-year-old Aleka Isabella Sheikh Gonzalez, but after he returned her to her mother, she died. 
Well, they say they later seized snakes and related equipment in his Agassiz home, and further tests confirmed the child was poisoned and killed by snake venom. Thomas made the plea in provincial court in North Vancouver today. Sentencing is set for October 3rd. Well, ever think about what happens to the light bulbs you have in your home or business after you toss them in a the trash? Well, some of them contain mercury, which can be harmful to your health and the environment. Well, now the federal government has unveiled a national strategy outlining how we should deal with those lamps. Our Kayla Hounsell has a look at how it works. Powering up and then it's all systems go to prevent the mercury inside these light bulbs from ending up at the landfill. The bulbs are loaded in the hopper. The glass goes one way, the phosphorus powder that contains the mercury goes another. It's sucked back through these pipes, through these filters, down into 45 gallon drums. David Hall says recycling light bulbs in a way that prevents mercury from getting into the environment is the brightest idea he's ever had. It affects health issues and uh, it contaminates uh, waterways, like for example, a four foot fluorescent bulb contains 22 milligrams of mercury, and 22 milligrams of mercury will contaminate 220,000 liters of water. Now a new national strategy seeks to avoid exactly that, the brainchild of Liberal MP Darren Fisher. It's not going to make sure that none of it happens, it's going to decrease how much does happen. The number of lamps containing mercury in Canada is decreasing, but there were still 35 million sold in 2017. Only a third of them were diverted from landfills. While we're visiting, a customer comes by. So why do you think this is important enough to go well, through the trouble of coming down here? Well, this is all dangerous chemicals inside these bulbs. The national strategy seeks to stop the import of most lamps containing mercury in Canada and dispose of existing lamps in an environmentally sound way. But it doesn't make light bulb recycling law. It should be a must. Uh, I mean, it's a must to recycle paint. It's a must to recycle tires. It's a must to recycle oil. Always a jurisdictional issue. So you've got your municipalities handle solid waste. You've got your provincial governments that dictate what goes in the landfill through their permit. And the federal government dictates what you can do with toxic chemicals. The government intends to report on the strategy's effectiveness every five years. If everybody is, wants to save the planet, then this is one of the things that they could do to help. Kayla Hounsell, CBC News, Dartmouth. Well, it seems cats in North America are getting bigger. But what is it that's making our furry friends fatter? A possible answer coming up.
In December, an arrest was made that put Canada into the middle of a trade war between the United States and China. Ms. Meng, what do you have to say to the charges? Download Sanction today at cbc.ca slash sanctioned or wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, a new study involving millions of cats from across Canada and the United States is confirming a fact many pet owners and veterinarians have probably suspected for a long time. Yeah, there's no beating around this one. Cats mm. today, quite simply, are just fatter than they used to be. And as Christine Barak reports, it may be impacting their health. Until now, even veterinarians didn't know for sure. But it's true, cats have gotten fatter. Researchers crunched the numbers from 19 million electronic data records for cats here in Canada and the United States. And their findings raise important questions about the overall health of cats. Well, a few years ago, if you talked about fat cats, people would laugh it off. But I think everybody's taking obesity more seriously now. Beyond the kitten phase, researchers at the University of Guelph say cats are continuing to get bigger as they age. And their average weight ease up from what it was 25 years ago. Our cats by eight years of age had gained an average of a half a kilo or a pound, which is 20% of their body weight. And we know that obesity is related to a lot of diseases, diabetes, uh, some obesity-related cancers, and uh, arthritis. They found male cats tended to reach higher weight peaks than females, and spayed or neutered cats tended to be heavier than unfixed cats because their metabolism often slows down after the procedure. This veterinarian says there are several reasons why cats are getting bigger. People now are more likely to keep their cats indoors, and of course by doing that, you tend to get cats that become more sedentary. And, you know, food is love sometimes too, so a way to show affection to your cat is to, con to continue to feed them. And I think people have gotten away from actually measuring up how much food they're supposed to have. You might be wondering, so how much should my cat weigh? While it depends on their age, researchers say they haven't come up with an ideal weight just yet, but say it helps to keep track at home. And if your pet is losing or gaining too much weight too quickly, you should get them checked out. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. <laughs> well, yeah, Garfield, you mentioned Garfield? Exactly. I mean, that big orange one that was just lounging around, that's kind yeah, of what I thought. Grumpy cat. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, exercise and better diet. There See? Very important yeah, things. applicable there. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, as I mentioned, we may be seeing some of that wet rain coming in the next couple of hours, but at midday this afternoon, it was mm. actually pretty perfect. Yeah, out. it was fantastic. Uh, that's right. The Hamiltones took the stage today here at CBC Vancouver a part of our musical Nooners series, and they were awesome. Awesome. Have a listen. All right. It'll bring me to peace. Tones play at the Vancouver Folk Festival this weekend. And you can join us tomorrow for Midnight Sun. The Nooners run every day at noon, of course, right here on the CBC Outdoor Plaza in Vancouver, right through until August 16th. Yes, the Hamiltons. Yeah. From nowhere near Hamilton, yeah. but on Hamilton Street. Oh, okay. Actually from North Carolina. So. No, really? Yeah, yeah. All right, well, that makes a little more sense. I love their sound there. That was a really yeah. good, upbeat kind of vibe, nice and soulful. They were awesome. Really yeah, cool. Yeah. So join us for a nooner one of these days. Yeah, absolutely. That's it for our newscast tonight. Dan Burritt's here at 11 o'clock right after the National. Have a good night. Good night.